Tonight I want to talk about contemplating not-self. Not-self is one of the distinguishing characteristics of the Buddha as a teacher. The Buddha was one of a whole number of spiritual teachers wandering around northern India, you know, roughly 500 BC. And they fell into certain categories. A lot of people taught meditation, a lot of people taught the way to liberation, a lot of people taught, taught various philosophies. And there was so much going on that the, the teachers were classified uh, in certain ways. For example, there were teachers who taught action and those who did not. Um, the Buddha taught action, karma. That was one of his characteristics. But what, what distinguished him and his approach was his emphasis on anatta in Pali or anatman in Sanskrit. Atman, of course, is self. And it's one of the key terms in the Indian yoga and spiritual traditions. The many different schools of Indian practice and, and, and thought are based on this idea of atma, the self, the essential self, the real self. Sometimes in English you have it, the self with a capital S, as distinct from the small self, the, the little self. And along with atman you get this concept of brahman, which goes along with it. And these are, are, are really basic to you know, a lot of the Indian traditions. The Buddha taught an-atman, and an is the negative prefix, not self. Th at the time, this would have been quite radical. It's like, in a sense, if he was looking for market share, this, is, this would be, in his advertising campaign, this would really distinguish him. So it's quite, it's, it was probably at the time quite radical, and it still is. There are two aspects of the teaching that you sometimes get strong reaction to. One is dukkha, suffering, like people don't want to hear about it often, and the other is not self. That also is threatening. And it's radical today because you know, a lot of the people who would turn up to a Buddhist retreat would practice in other uh, Indian traditions, and of course in these other traditions, Atman, there it is, it's self as I say, often d characterized by the big S as distinct from the small S. And so to say, well, you know, the Buddha says, no, not self. Sometimes this anatman is translated as non-self, sometimes as no self. It's always a negative, but which negative? I translate it as not self. And perhaps the reason why will become clearer as, as we speak. So this idea of not self is quite crucial. It's quite odd in a sense. It can be quite challenging what's going on. And pr it's probably meant to be, but it does distinguish the Buddha's approach to his teaching and to practice, to, wh to what it is that we're doing in this retreat. F uh, according to the tradition, he first taught not-self in his second discourse, the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the discourse on the characteristics of not self. The first discourse that he taught was the Dhamma Chaka Pavantana Sutta, setting in motion the Dharma wheel. Uh, and this was where he taught the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and the Middle Way. And this was this first discourse was given to five of his former companions, you know, five men who were with him when, before he became Buddha, when he was doing. Uh, ascetic practices. This is another Indian tradition where the idea of self-mortification, where you would inflict pain upon yourself in order to overcome the body and the mind. That kind of tradition is very widespread. You find it in, in the European tradition, uh, the Christians took it up. And of course it's quite widespread in India as well. Siddhartha Gautama, before he became the Buddha, practiced in this tradition, but um, gave it up because he felt it was getting nowhere. And in fact, he was such an extremist in his practice that he was on the point of death, so he stopped doing it. And he had five companions who were as fanatical as he was, who were waiting for him to get enlightened because they wanted to be around when it happened. But they got disappointed when he gave up his ascetic practices, and so they, they went off in disgust. And so after Siddhartha recovered, and then he practiced under the Bodhi tree in a, in a much more sustainable manner, 
and he woke up and he became the Buddha, the awakened one. And then he thought, well, who will I teach? And the people he decided upon were his five former companions. So he went looking for them and found them in a, in a, in a place about 15 kilometers north of Varanasi called Sarnath. And he met them, overcame the, their initial resistance, taught them the first discourse, and this got them going, and then began the first Buddhist meditation retreat. In this particular retreat, there were five students. The teacher was the Buddha. The retreat lasted only five days, and at the end of the five days, everyone was fully enlightened. So it was definitely a successful retreat. <laughs> and it sets the standard. So please try to try to make it, maintain the standards. According, according to Buddhist tradition, uh, Buddhism um, peaked when the Buddha was alive, and it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> and this is, this is a, a tradition. In Theravada, it's felt that the, the, the sasana, um, you know, the institution of Buddhism, will last only 5,000 years, and we're already more than halfway through. So we're entering into the Dark Ages. So standards have, have slipped, but we have to do our, our utmost to keep them as high as possible. At the end of this discourse, the Buddha taught the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the characteristics of not-self. And it was during this discourse that his five companions, his, now his five students, gained full awakening. So it's regarded as a very significant discourse. It's one of the two key ones, one of these, this first two. So it's it's quite important, so I always like to have a, a talk in which I un, unpack it. So I'll just read out the, the essential part and then, then comment on it. Uh, the Buddha says, body is not self. If this body was self, it would not tend to get sick and I could make it become this or that. But because body is not self, it does tend to get sick and I cannot make it become this or that. Feeling is not self. Perception is not self. Formations are not self. Consciousness is not self. If this consciousness was self, it would not tend to get sick, and I could make it become this or that. But because consciousness is not self, it does tend to get sick, and I cannot make it become this or that. What do you think, Because Is body permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Bhante. And that which is impermanent, is it painful or pleasurable? Painful, Bhante. And that which is painful and subject to change, is it appropriate to regard it in terms of, this is mine, I am this, this is myself? Certainly not, Bhante. <coughs> Therefore, whatever is body, past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, high or low, near or far, all body should be seen with penetrating understanding as it is in this way. This is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. Whatever is feeling, whatever is perception, whatever are formations, whatever is consciousness, past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, high or low, near or far, all consciousness should be seen with penetrating understanding as it is in this way. This is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. Seeing in this way the trained, cultivated student is disenchanted with body, disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with formations, disenchanted with consciousness. Being disenchanted, her passion fades, and because of the fading of passion, she is liberated. When she is liberated, there is the knowledge, I am liberated, and she understands, birth is destroyed, the highest life is fulfilled, what should be done is done, there is no more becoming. This is what the Blessed One said, and the group of five bhikkhus rejoiced in the Blessed One's words. And as he spoke, the minds of the group of five bhikkhus were fully liberated from the taints. Then there were six arahants in the world. Uh, arahant means fully awakened. There were the five the students, and of course the Buddha was the first arahant. So now in the world there were six fully enlightened beings. So, just going through this. First of all, the subject of the discourse is essentially about identity. And one of the m uh, major themes of the Buddha's teaching is this whole question of identity. 
Who are we or who do we think we are? And when the, the, the Buddha is talking about identity, he's talking, he, what he, he's referring to something which is probably wider than our sense of what is identity. We tend to think of identity as, as personal, one's personal identity, and it's something which is ba- it's, it's within this body. But the Buddha is always coming from the, uh, the perspective of the way things are experienced. So, for example, I experience myself. Right? I exp- this is my body, I've got my thoughts going through, my emotions, I've got my memories and, and so on, my identity. But my experience of myself is always located. It's always somewhere, here. And it's surrounded by something, a world. In this case, the world includes this room with these people and, so, and this situation. So if there's me, there's my world. And if there's a world that I experience, then there's me. And they go together. They always go together. So, for example, if you think back to your earliest memory, when was the first time you can remember actually existing, actually being here? Well, and when that happened, if you think back to it, was there a world or not? And the answer is, well, of course there was. It's like we're always located within a world. Uh, and this is just the nature of experience. It's the nature of any kind of experience, much less human experience. So if there's an identity, then there's a world, which in a sense surrounds the identity, is centred on the identity. So there's me and there's my world. So when the Buddha's talking about identity, he's not just talking about this, he's talking about this, this bigger picture. Not just me, but my world, this world that we live in. He's not, when he talks, when he's interested in identity, he's not interested in certain types of questions about identity. For example, the question, who am I? This question is a very popular question in spiritual circles. You get it in in Zen, that's a koan, in the Zen tradition. It pops up in in the um, Advaita Vedanta tradition. It comes up in normal, everyday existential questioning. Who am I? What am I doing here? Who is doing this practice? Who's the one having these experiences? These kinds of questions you never find in the Buddha's teaching. He just doesn't ask them. And if somebody asks that kind of question to him, he puts it aside. That question does not apply. It's not relevant. He's just not interested in that. Because he's interested in something that goes a lot deeper than that. This question, who am I, is about, well, who is this person bounded by this skin? But the Buddha's interested in what is it that gives rise to the very idea of this person bounded by skin? Like what's underneath that causes it to to manifest in the first place? What brings it up and what brings it down? And what shapes it? What forms it? So he's interested in going a lot deeper. So he's just not bothered with that. Uh, uh, In a sense, the stuff further up. I remember years ago when I was in Thailand, uh, I was a monk in Thailand and I spent some time at a meditation centre where one of the meditators was a, a, a German monk who was long term at that centre because he was a close disciple of the, the Thai teacher. And we are having a talk one day and he, and he said how he, was, he read this book called Who Dies by Stephen Levine. I haven't read it but apparently it's a very good book, certainly very popular. And he read this book and he really liked it. He thought, this is great. And so he showed it to his teacher. You should read it. And the teacher looked at it and just handed it back immediately and said, wrong view. 
And the guy says, what do you mean, wrong view? You haven't even read it. How can you say that? And his teacher said, wrong question. <laughs> now, whether you think this is a good idea or not, it does show the approach that the, the, the Buddha takes. It's like the question that we ask is quite important. If we don't ask the right question, we don't get the right answer. And whatever question we come up with that's based on who, the, for the Buddha, the answer is not going to be satisfactory. It's not going to work. Because if we ask the question, who, we come up with someone. But if we come up with someone, we've still got a problem. So the Buddha is going deeper. He's got a different approach to this. When he talks about identity, he talks about it in, often in terms of the five aggregates, uh, body formations, perception. Good heavens, I've suddenly blanked out. <laughs> this is embarrassing. <laughs> body, feeling, perceptions, formations, consciousness. Now, these are five categories of experience from which we construct an identity and a sense of a coherent world. They're the five categories of experience that we normally identify with. So this is why he talks about them. But you notice how he doesn't speak about the person. He doesn't even talk about the person. He talks about these five aggregates. Because for him, it's like already he's going beneath the person to what are the raw materials from which we construct a person. Ah, the five aggregates. So that's the level that he's working on. The five aggregates, um, body, means all physical experience. So everything that I see, everything that I hear, everything that I smell, everything that I taste, everything that I touch is body. So not just, usually body we would think of in terms of touch. But body has a, has a broader meaning here. It's like the entire physical, the entire experienced physical universe is body. The whole, the whole box and dice. Then there's feeling. Feeling is the hedonic or affective aspect of experience. Feeling is the flavour of, of experience. It's the aspect of experience that moves us. Feeling Vedana is the... Is the Pali term, it's not emotion, although every emotion has feeling. It's the, it's the affective quality of experience. And it's not most normally talked about in terms of three categories, pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful. Whatever experience we undergo, we are moved by that experience. We are affected by that experience, moved by it. I have the experience of coolness and I am moved by that experience. Get the blanket, put it on. I have the experience of hardness. I am moved by that experience. Get a more comfortable cushion. If I register an experience as pleasant, I am moved to reach towards it, to hold on to it. If I register it as painful, I am moved to back away from or resist it or reject it. Often, for example, we talk about positive emotions, negative emotions. Well, really what we're talking about are emotions that move us to hold on to the experience. This is what we call positive. Emotions that move us to get away from the experience. This is what we call negative. It's about how we are moved by experience. So the two obvious feelings are pleasant and painful. The third one, neither painful nor pleasant, sometimes translated neutral feeling, is harder to pick and often we miss it. The, the kind of feeling or the kind of experience that we ignore or pass over or don't notice because it's not, it doesn't really register with us because we're not moved to either grab it or to push it away. So body, feeling, perception. Perception essentially is recognition. So the ear, for example, 
hears sound. Now, sound is part of body. It's physical. But then I register uh, these particular sounds are somebody talking to me about Buddhism, whereas those sounds are the sounds of traffic. And these other sounds are the sounds of birds. So the ability to, to distinguish this and to recognise, oh, this is a talk on Buddhism, that's a bird, is perception. And it's not the sound, it's what we do with the sound. So perception is the way we recognise what we experience and construct something out of it, something familiar. Then we have formations. Formations are essentially our basic drives and impulses. They are what come up from the unconscious and push us to take various choices. They manifest, one way in which they manifest are as our choices. So I'm feeling uncomfortable and I, and I automatically move. Where did that, what was that impulse to move? It's a formation. It comes up as a choice, which I might not even notice at the time. But these, we're constantly making these choices and these choices form or create ourselves and our world we're constantly being pushed by our, our, our drives, our desires, our fears, aspirations and so on and on the basis of these making choices and heading off in certain directions and doing certain things. They're called formations because they form, they construct. They're one of the chief ways in which we, we form or construct ourselves. And they manifest uh, frequently as our habits all our habitual reactions and responses. These are the formations coming up. Then there's consciousness. Consciousness is the pure knowing or witnessing of the experience. When we talk about just witness the experience, we're saying emphasize consciousness. Put your you know, awareness on the conscious, consciousness aspect. Consciousness is the pure presence of the experience. So these are the, these are the five aggregates and we identify with these and we construct a self and a world out of them. So body, this is my body and this is who I am. I am short. I am getting old and so on. Feeling, the way that we are moved by experience, we identify with that too. I like coffee. I don't like tea. That's me. Uh, we, we identify with these perceptions I perceive myself to be a certain person, a certain kind of person I actually I, I'll just let you in on the secret, I'm a very good kind of person uh, really worth knowing <laughs> and really worthwhile kind of person um, that's me that's who I am and if you don't recognise that, then obviously you've got a problem, haven't you? <laughs> you know. And, of course, you are who I perceive you to be. <laughs> and, and so we, 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 we have perceptions, of re recognitions, like we, we, we peg someone and then we just don't let them out of that category for years. Got you pegged. I know who you are. You can't fool me. This is perception and we identify with it and construct an identity and a world out of that. Formations. I identify with I am my drives, my desires, my fears, my impulses and so on. I, I identify deeply with these. These define me. And then consciousness. I am the one who knows this. When I'm meditating, for instance, let's say it's, it's going really well, mind is very peaceful and so on, I am the one who knows this peace, who is completely quiet and so on. So we identify with consciousness. So the five aggregates, are what the Buddha is talking about, are the ways in which we identify with experience and construct a self, someone here who's undergoing this. Now, we do this we construct a self because, of course, we need to. 
No, we, we need to be someone in order to function. Otherwise, we couldn't. You know, people who don't construct a sense of self are in deep trouble. People whose sense of self is very fragile are in deep trouble. We need a sense of self. We need a robust sense of self. Otherwise, we can't, we can't function. But from the Buddhist perspective, we make a fundamental mistake. We, we mistake something which is constructed and formed out of the materials available, something which is an emergent property, latch onto it, and think that this is an absolute, that this exists somehow independently, independent of conditions, and that this is the most important thing. And everything else is judged in accordance with its relationship to this self that I've constructed. So we construct a self, and we're doing it all of the time. We're doing it right now. But we lose sight of the fact that we're constructing it, we take it as an absolute and we give it absolute value. You know, it's all about me. The, the advertising industry really knows how to zero in on this. There are ads now that say huge banners, it's about you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they really understand human nature. And you can see that, that, you know, how the self operates when you look at the ads. Because I, I, I travel so much, so I see the ads at the airports. Uh, there's, I think for, there's a virgin blue ad where, that shows an empty plane except for one seat with one guy sitting it in his business suit and he's looking really pleased. I'm the only one in this plane. Me! <laughs> I look at it and I think, God, I'd hate to fly on that plane. <laughs> But apparently this is really attractive to people, you know. Me, I'm the only one, and everyone's hovering around. And, you know, and this is, this is the, the self, this is how, how it works. And of course, it's always incredibly fragile, because it is just a construct. It is a formation. It is constructed out of parts, dependent upon conditions. So you change the conditions and you change the self. You change the conditions and the self dissolves. So it constantly has to be defended and propped up. And again, you know, the, the advertising industry knows this. The advertisements that um, show the really good looking person dressed in appropriate black leaning over, showing the appropriate watch. You know, it's like this is what you, you can identify with. You are your really classy watch. <laughs> yeah. and they, they do this because it sells, because we buy it, literally. Yeah, I'll take that watch. Now I'm, really, now I'm real. Now I'm really someone, because I've got the watch. Except that, wait a minute, didn't my neighbour just p p drive by in the classy new car? Damn it, I've got to get that. It's always fragile. And we're, we're constantly scrambling to defend it and to patch it up and to reassure it and to put an extra story on it and so on. Deep down we know that it's just a construction. It's a sandcastle and the water's already coming in. We don't want to see this. We want to push away this knowledge. In the Western tradition it's often felt that the, the fundamental fear that we have as human beings is the fear that one day in the future we will die and that you know, so much of civilization is built on pushing that aside, that, 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 that fear. From the Buddhist perspective, that's not the fundamental fear. The fundamental fear is that right now, we're not real. That's the fundamental fear. And it's that that we keep at bay by our, our busy projects of, of struggling to become someone. We, someone we can convince ourselves that I'm, that I'm real, and that I'm all right, that I'm okay. And of course, we're social beings. We live in a world, and this world has other selves wandering around in it, so we have to justify ourselves to them and play out our social roles. I have to be good enough for them as well as for me, so it's a double burden. 
and I have this suspicion that I'm not really good enough. So I have to vigorously try to make myself good enough or pretend to others that I really am good enough. And, and so we keep playing these games. And it's all inherent in this fundamental mistake that we make of taking something which is just a construct and treating it as if it's not. So this is the self and it works according to, according to the Buddha on the basis of two fundamental movements. This is mine. I am this. This is myself. Three fundamental movements, sorry. This is mine. Possession. The self seeks to possess. Hence the advertising industry, hence consumerism. This is mine. I am this. The ultimate form of possession is, ident is identification. I put the watch on and now I'm bigger, more important. I am the, la you know, the man with the watch. This is mine. I am this. This is myself. And this is myself represents the views and ideas and justifications that we create in the mind to explain all this and, and justify it. The Buddha in this discourse then proceeds to dismantle the whole project. He says, body is not self. If this body was self, it would not tend to get sick and I could make it become this or that. But because body is not self, it does tend to get sick and I cannot make it become this or that. Now his argument here is, if we're going to claim something as self, then it should have certain characteristics in order to make this just justified. The first is that it should be under our control. You know, what is the point of having a self that I'm not in charge of? The self is the one who's always in charge. It's the self who decides, oh, that was a good sitting, or oh, that was a bad sitting. This is a good day. This is a bad day. That's the self who's making these judgments. The self is the one in charge of the whole project. The self is constantly seeking to control. But what does it control? Well, we identify with the body. I am my body. Well, if I'm my body, I should have some control. I do have some control, obviously. But it, sickness is an area where we suddenly realise I'm not in charge, actually. I don't control my body. But what does it mean to have a possession, my, over which I have absolutely no control? What kind of possession is that? It's, it doesn't work. And then he goes through, feeling is not self, perception is not self, formations are not self, consciousness is not self. If this consciousness was self, it would not tend to get sick and I could make it become this or that. But because consciousness is not self, it does tend to get sick and I cannot make it become this or that. When we start meditating, it's pretty obvious that our minds are not under our control. Can I get up in the morning and decide, okay, now today, just for a change, I think I'll have happiness followed by contentment bit of joy in the afternoon and I'll just settle for a bit of contentment in the evening and I think I'll just have ever deepening concentration and peace in the meditation. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. We're not in control of our minds. We're not in control of our bodies. We're not in control of the people around us. So what's the point of trying to identify with it? It doesn't work. What do you think? Is body permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Bhante. And that which is impermanent, is it painful or pleasurable? Painful, Bhante. Now, why would the Buddha say or imply that change is painful? You know, surely change is good. <coughs> if things don't change, you get bored. What he's talking about here is, as he's established first, it's not simply that things change but they're out of control. Things change 
and I'm not in charge of the changes. My experience is constantly changing, but I'm not in charge. My body is changing, it's getting older, but I can't do anything about it. That's the way it is. My mind is changing, but I can't seem to control it. People around me are changing, but I can't seem to stop them from changing. It's interesting when people take up some kind of spiritual practice or meditation practice, sometimes their friends or, and, or, or loved ones get really agitated and upset and they, don't, and they resist, they don't want you to do it. And they might not have any coherent reason for objecting, but what it boils down to is the fear of change, the fear that if you do this, you will change. You won't be the person that they used to know. And the thing is, of course, they're right. There's a real wisdom in that fear because we are changing and the changes are out of their control. They're out of our control. Sometimes we recognise this, we intuit this, and it's quite fearful and painful. Uh, insight meditation has a lot to do with the fact of change and of our relationship to change. We may talk about that, that later in the retreat. And that which is painful and subject to change is it appropriate to regard it in terms of this is mine, I am this, this is myself. Is it appropriate to try to, to own and, and identify with and control that which I can clearly see is out of control? No, because I'm giving myself a thrashing for nothing. I can't control my experience. This is very important in the meditation practice. I'm not in charge. In, uh, in Burma, where I did most of my training, the teachers there would say, the yogi has one duty, and that is to note. That's all. And what they're saying is, it's not your business to become a great meditator. It's not your business to fulfill this role or that role or the other role. You've got one job, and that is be aware of what's happening. That's all. Because that's all we can do. We can make that choice to be present now. But we can't control the outcome. We don't know what's going to happen as a result. What we could find happening is everything falling apart and crumbling and, you know, struggle, struggle, struggle. Or what could happen is, you know, deep concentration, incredible insights, whatever. Or anything in between. Or zigzagging madly between the two. We don't know and we can't control it. So surrendering to the process is very important. It's fundamental to this because we, we're not in charge of it. This, of course, is where faith comes in. Faith plays a crucial role in this practice. This sense of, of trust, of entrusting oneself to something much bigger than ourselves and being willing to be taken on this journey. So the Buddha says, therefore, whatever is body, past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, high or low, near or far, all body should be seen with penetrating understanding as it is in this way. This is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. And he goes on to the other aggregates. This is not mine. I am not this. This is not myself. And this is the contemplation of not self. Now, what he's talking about when he's talking about self and not self, essentially what he's talking about are relationships. Self is not a something that we, we come across and say, here it is. Not self is not a something that we discover one day and say, here it is, I got it. Self and not self are both relationships. Self is a relationship of possession this is mine, and identification. I am this. Not-self is a relationship of not possessing, this is not mine, 
and not identifying. I am not this. I am not this. So, for example, I have in the meditation painful emotions or painful thoughts. Self is to make them move. Ah, oh, this is mine. These are my uh, feelings, my thoughts, and identification. I am this. This is who I am. I am the person playing out in this thought scenario. This is who I am, and this is the way the world is. And then we start to project t- permanence onto it. This, it's always been like this for me. It will always be like this for me. And we create this whole world based on these two movements. This is mine, I am this. And these movements are what we're used to. This is what we've been doing for decades. But it's now spun out of control. Whereas not-self is a relationship where it, when the painful thought, the painful emotion comes out and we recognise this isn't mine and I am not this. It doesn't mean that the thoughts and emotions and so on suddenly evaporate into nothing. It doesn't mean that you know, we just go around thinking of Buddha. It means that we go through what we go through, but we allow it to flow much more freely than before because we're not grabbing onto it and, f- and trying to freeze it by identification and possession, but allowing it to move the way that it moves. It's not something which is under our control. It's just something that comes and goes according to conditions. And what I'm doing is watching it. That's my job. I'm a meditator. That's what I do. Seeing in this way, the trained, cultivated student is disenchanted with body, disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with formations, disenchanted with consciousness, Being disenchanted, her passion fades, and because of the fading of passion, she is liberated. When she is liberated, there is the knowledge, I am liberated, and she understands. Birth is destroyed, the highest life is fulfilled, what should be done is done, there is no more becoming. Now, the turning point here is what the Buddha calls disenchantment, nibbada in in Pali. This is quite crucial. To get a sense of what he's talking about, if we think about the opposite of disenchantment is enchantment. Enchantment is the fascination that results in clinging. Have you had the experience where you're meditating away and suddenly you realise you're caught up in thought? And then the next moment you realise, I'm not supposed to be thinking this, I'm supposed to be meditating. And immediately following this thought is the thought, I'll just finish this one off and then I'll go back. And that, that response, I'll just finish this one off, is really interesting. Because do you notice how it doesn't just happen with the happy thoughts, it also happens with the painful ones. This excruciating scenario that I'm putting myself th- through for about the hundredth time today, with all, each time exactly the same ending, I'll just run through it one more time. <laughs> then I'll go back. It's fascinating the way, the, the way that we do that again and again. Why? We are enchanted by the thought. It's not the thought, it's the self. Because the thought is a way that we construct ourselves. This is me starring in this particular melodrama. That's why the melodrama is so important. That's why my melodramas are much more important than your melodramas, because my melodramas star me. <laughs> yeah, it's, this, is, this is the way that we behave all of the time. This is enchantment, fascination. We're enchanted with it. We, we're, it's that sticky quality that the thinking has that sucks us in every time. This is enchantment. Disenchantment is the experience of having had enough, of actually having enough. So it comes up, we recognise it, and it's like, no. And, and as soon as we make that, no, it's gone. It's not suppression. 
It's just at some point, that's enough. Enough. And at that point, it stops. But until we genuinely have had enough, it'll keep rolling on because it's feeding something quite vital to us, our sense of ourselves, our own reality. So disenchantment is this experience of finally having had enough. And when we have enough, we let it go. In Buddhism, we hear a lot about this idea of letting go. We're we're sometimes exhorted to let go. But of course, what do we let go of? We let go of what we don't want anymore. (laughs) That's what we let go of. Enough. You can have it. Um, So this is disenchantment. Being disenchanted, her passion fades. This word passion is a poor translation, but a lot of these terms, they have no exact English equivalent. It it's, it's, it makes it difficult. Uh, the word translated as passion is raga, which literally means colour. And it, what it refers to is essentially obsession. When we're obsessed with something, it's like the mind is coloured by the obsession. So again, if you think about an obsessive thought or emotion, when it comes up, it's like it has a, a colour to it or a flavour. And this, this colour dominates. And that's all that we can, we can register at that time. And this is raga. And its opposite is vitraga, the fading of passion. And the image is like if you have a white cloth and put dye through it and it comes up, it's brightly coloured. And then, but if you wash it repeatedly, gradually the colour fades and it goes back to white. The mind is like a white cloth, but it becomes coloured by its obsessions. And in the practice, we're washing it out, washing and washing and washing, and gradually the colour fades. Viraga, the fading of of the colour. The colour fades, and because of the fading of of colour, she is liberated. She lets something go enough, I'm out of there. And so, and this is an ongoing process. Liberation is an ongoing process. There are particular, what in the Western tradition are sometimes called peak experiences, which all, the, all traditions map in some way or another. And these are quite important, but it's an ongoing process every day of washing and, and, and fading. And it's based on really being with the experience and seeing what it is and seeing that if it's unsatisfactory, let it go. Just let it go. One of the things that happens as we mature in the practice is that we start to shed, we start to let go. And we start to feel more light and more open as a result. And we become increasingly sensitive to that which uh, closes us in again. We develop a lightness of being. And then when we fall into obsession, which we do, it becomes excruciatingly painful because we feel hemmed in by it, trapped by it, more so than before. Before, we used to take it as normal as just this is me and this is the world. But now we recognise that no, this is just, this is something extra. And so we we become more sensitive to it and it becomes more painful. And because of that, we we become disenchanted and we let it go faster. So it's, it's an ongoing process. We keep shedding what we can see quite clearly is totally unsatisfactory. It just doesn't work anymore. So keep letting it go. It's a natural process of disenchantment. What happens as this process deepens is paradoxically not the disappearance of self but the emergence of a different self. And again, a sense of self is necessary. We have to be someone. Otherwise we couldn't function. And if you look at the Buddha and the, the awakened ones, they had a very clear sense of self. I mean, the Buddha knew exactly who he was uh, and let people know about it. But we learn 
not to hold ourselves so tightly, we recognise that the roles we play in society and even to ourselves are just that. They're just roles that we play. And so we don't take them so seriously. We don't take ourselves so seriously. What happens as we mature in the practice is we become much lighter than we were before. We don't have that heavy, tight quality that you sometimes recognise in people. We, we may be quite serious in our purpose, in what we're doing with our lives, but we are light in our being with it. And, and this is uh, quite important. Sometimes you, you meet spiritual people who are very heavy. They take themselves very seriously. From, and from the Buddha's perspective, it's not working. Because how can you take seriously something that doesn't exist? One would expect a lightness of being in a, a, a spiritually mature person. A seriousness of purpose, yes, sure but a lightness of being. And one of the characteristics of the emergence of this self which is not self is a sense of having less to defend. You know, sometimes it, when you're around certain people, it's like sometimes you feel you have to be really, really careful about what you do or say. Because you say, say, some, say the wrong thing and you've, you've struck a chord. There's, oh my God you realise you've just attacked this person. You had no idea you were attacking the person, but apparently you have because now they're bashing you <laughs> in response. <laughs> but as we mature, we become far less defensive because we haven't got so much to defend. There's a wonderful Zen story that, that illustrates this. It's called Eating the Blame. And it's set in a, in a certain Zen monastery where one morning there were important ceremonies which everybody had to attend. So after the ceremonies, the, the, the cook who had to produce lunch on time um, had very little time left and so he dashes out into the garden to, to you know, whip up some veggies, runs into the kitchen, puts them on the, um, the, the board, chop, 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 into the pot, stir, bit of this, bit of that and just in time gets the veggie soup out to the monks. And of course, Zen monasteries are strictly vegetarian, so it is veggie soup. But, a, but what the cook hadn't noticed in his haste was that he hadn't just collected veggies from the garden, he had also collected a snake and chopped it up and cooked it. And the first sign of trouble was when the monks were all commenting that they had never tasted such delicious and interesting vegetable soup. <laughs> But it was the, the old teacher himself who found a snake's head in his spoon. And the teacher summoned the cook in front of everybody. And he held up the spoon with a snake's head in it. And he said, what is this? And the cook immediately took the spoon, put it in his mouth, chewed, swallowed, and said, ah, delicious. The story is called Eating the Blame. And of course, you think about what, what would you or I have done had we been in that cook's position. Well, you, I don't get any extra help in the kitchen, do I? <laughs> you expect me to produce three meals a day, seven days a week. I've got to go to all these damn ceremonies. I don't get any help. Blah-dee, 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 blah you know, We would have defended ourselves. But the cook didn't because he had no one to defend. So given that situation, what could he do? Well, he could dance. And his dance was, in that particular instance, was to do what he did. But he could have done something else. The point is, he was free. He was free to dance with the situation. He wasn't locked in. And this is the freedom of not-self, the lightness of it, the play of it. This, this freedom comes from clearly seeing ourselves construct ourselves, which is what we're doing in this practice. And it's quite a shock when we start to see it, because it's, it's never a pleasant sight. But it's only when we get fed up with it that we'll stop doing it. And then if we let go of our normal habitual responses, then we create a space in which something new, something else, can begin to emerge. 
And this is all part of the, the ongoing process that we're engaged in. Okay, that's enough for tonight. Thank you. <laughs>